Hello, and welcome everyone to the 19th webinar in Contact's Produce Safety Webinar Series. This third season continues to tackle fresh produce safety topics every month through a dynamic webinar series that brings together industry, academia, and regulatory minds to solve some of the produce industry's most timely challenges. This series is part of a larger industry outreach and risk mitigation project called CONTACT, or Scientific Challenges and Cost-Effective Management of Risks Associated with Implementation of Produce Safety Regulations. This project is supported by the Specialty Crops Research Initiative from the USDA National Institute of Food and Agriculture. Any opinions, findings, conclusions, or recommendations expressed in this presentation are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the view of the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Who is CONTACT, you might ask? Over 10 different universities and government institutions make up the CONTACT team, not to mention the support of our PAC, or Produce Advisory Committee. Michelle Daniluk, professor at the University of Florida, is our team fearless leader. It takes a village, and we appreciate each individual's support and ongoing efforts to make CONTACT a grant championed by you all. This year, we'll begin each webinar with an update about one of CONTACT's seven research and extension objectives. Today, we're going to highlight some of the work from Objective 2. As a reminder, Objective 2 is focused on discovering strategies to reduce introduction of microbial hazards to specialty crops by biological soil amendments of animal origin during uh, production. They have several sub-objectives and studies ongoing. Here, though, we're going to take a sneak peek. We have log CFU per gram of soil on the y-axis, basically the amount of E. coli in the soil, and time and days on the x-axis. The lines represent the log reduction of E. coli, TVS-353, an environmental E. coli strain commonly used in studies that's been found to be more robust than our pathogen E. coli strains. It makes it a great one to use in our field studies. Here we're looking at this over time in a growing field of Vidalia onions. Overall, the figure shows the decline of non-pathogenic E. coli in Georgia soils that were amended with composted poultry litter, heat-treated poultry litter pellets, or left unamended. You can see by the red line, heat-treated poultry pellet amended soil supported E. coli survival at higher levels during the study after 110 days. Interested to learn more? This is only a snapshot. Reach out to our fabulous Biological Soil Amendment of Animal Origin team. Their pictures and affiliations are on the slide. This year's webinar series will always address topics chosen by you. The last of the webinar series will focus on sanitation at retail. Don't forget to quickly tell us your thoughts in the survey evaluations as you exit the webinar. Stay tuned for our spring 2024 webinar list, which will be released at next month's webinar. Be sure to check out Contact's website and our YouTube page for more produce safety resources, including our key takeaway documents summarizing the webinars, our webinar recordings if you missed it, and much more. Subscribe to our page and get instant notifications of content. It's always great content for a midday walk. If you use biological soil amendments of animal origin, we'd also appreciate if you helped us by taking our survey. We want to know how you use these on your farm, so scan or click on this QR code. If you scan or click the QR code, it will take you to a Rutgers Qualtrics survey page. Scroll all the way down to the bottom, where you can consent to take the survey. It's only about 10 questions. It looks a little bit scarier and we're sorry for some of that red tape. We do take your confidentiality really seriously. And again, it's completely confidential. A quick reminder for today, if you'd like to submit a question for our speakers during or before, please use the, key, the Q&A as a box. However, we have enabled the chat box uh, for the first time in forever. And this is because some of our speakers want to get a little bit of engagement with you. So feel free. You may get the opportunity to use the chat box. Now let's welcome our fantastic lineup of speakers for today. First, we have Billy Mitchell, who works for Florida Organic Growers and is the co-manager of the Southeast Regional Transition to Organic Partnership Program. Born and raised in Chicago, Illinois, he has spent the past 20 years learning about vegetable production, food safety, and adult education from an incredible mix of teachers, including farmers, extension, 
non-for-profit staff and professors. Fun fact, his first two memories are food related. The first is eating fruit with his grandmother and smiling. And the second is eating ice cream, screaming with his grandmother and screaming that he got his first ever ice cream headache. Or I think, Billy, this would be a brain freeze. Jackie Gordon is the director of training, education, and member services for the Washington State Tree Fruit Association. Born and raised in Ecuador, she's been in the U.S. for about 10 years and in her current position for eight years. Fun fact about Jackie, when she tells others that she comes from Ecuador, people seem to think that she must come from a humid tropical jungle and that she loves hot summers. But this is far from the truth. Actually, she grew up on the mountainside in Ecuador and prefers cold weather, though she was quick to note, not too cold. Sounds like me, Jackie. Dr. Betsy Ben is the director of of the Produce Safety Alliance and National GAPS program, as well as the executive director of the Institute for Food Safety at Cornell University. Fun fact about Betsy, she owns a farm and has the most fantastic rabbit, Rochester, as well as 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 an avid swimmer, hiker, and cyclist. Dr. Kristen Woods has served in several extension roles supporting community education and economic development in the area of food safety and food systems. In January 2023, Kristen joined the Tuskegee University Cooperative Cooperative Extension Program team as a sustainable food system specialist for diverse farming systems. Fun fact, Kristen embraces a lifelong love of agriculture and currently owns and operates a small diversified farm in Southwest Alabama, and she has fantastic goats. Thank you in advance to all of our speakers, and Billy, why don't you kick us off? Great. Thank you, Laura. Thank you for reminding me. It's a brain freeze, not an ice cream headache. That does, it just sounds better. So I'm so glad to be with all y'all here this afternoon and to Yeah, kick this off and set the foundation for the next three speakers. And to do that, we just want to start off with just talking about, like, why are we here? So if in the chat box you want to say who you are, where you are, and why you're here today, what motivated you to come to this webinar, that'll give us just a little bit better idea, maybe some things we can touch on, if not in our presentations, certainly during our Q&A. So if you want to take a second in the chat box, just say who you are where you are and why you're here today. For example, my name is Billy Mitchell. Where I am today is Biloxi, Mississippi. And the reason I'm here is I had the opportunity to really start teaching food safety and produce safety about seven years ago. And I found myself in these rooms with just amazing farmers, microbiologists, organic chemists, sanitation experts, all teaching these things that they were incredibly passionate about. And what I came to realize, though, is that while we were all doing adult education almost on a day-to-day basis, sometimes with like harvest crews within facilities, almost none of us had a background in adult education. A lot of us were just learning how to do this on the fly. We knew what we were talking about. We didn't always know how to explain it. And I will say that the majority of people were doing an amazing job, but probably a lot of us have been in at least one college class where your professor knows more about that subject than anyone else on the planet, and they have the hardest time explaining that subject. And today we're really going to talk about not just what happens in the training program, but how do we talk about these different things. And so I'm super excited to see a bunch of stuff coming in to the Q&A, including learning about training tools. Yeah, just looking to recharge. We'll go through some of these and I'll go through some of these while the other presenters are going and we'll definitely come back to a lot of this. Oh man, someone is a gardener. That's great. During the rest of the presentation. And Alexis, at any time, if there's one that really just makes you feel excited, you can blurt it out. And with that, if you'll go to the next slide, please. So we're first just talk about like the what, you know, this is what I think a lot of us are really comfortable with. Day in, day out, we can talk about what should be in a food safety training program. Like here's a great slide from the Produce Safety Alliance, principles of food hygiene and food safety. We can talk about what we should train. And the way we do it is through presentation. We take information that we're really confident in and we present it to an audience. Sometimes there's some conversation. Sometimes it's just like this, just talking out to an audience or to a crew. But we've got a presentation We take the information and what we're hoping for is a change in knowledge. They've learned something. So that's the what. And I think a lot of people on this call, we like, we know the what, 
inside and out. People can tell you the CFRs. They can tell you the different rates for chemicals. We're very good. We're very strong on the what. And if you go to the next slide, Alexis, I think what we're really excited about also is like the how. How do we move from presentation of the information to education? So we're really good at presenting it, but we want to go to educating it. So there's not just a change in knowledge, but there's also a change in behavior that people are able to take the information that we've shared and that other people in the class share, and they're able to go back to their farm, their facility, their classroom, and change what they're doing, that they're able to implement the information that we've presented. Here's a picture of me with a bunch of compost on my hand, using activity that the Produce Safety Alliance helped develop, where I had a chance to present a bunch of information about soil amendments, and then really get out there with these producers and squeeze some compost, look at some thermometers, really give them a chance to engage with the information. And hopefully they went back to their farms and they were able to make a change in the behavior and the way that they were composting and the record keeping. And one of the main like wonderful things about our jobs is I was able to hear from farmers who have changed their practices on their farm. And so we had the what, we talked about the information, and then the way that we were able to teach it and learn together, we were able to see a change in behavior. So today we're really focusing on that how. And so I've had a chance to see a bunch of things pop in about who you are, where you are, and why you're here. And if you go to the next slide, Alexis, now what we would like to know in the chat is just what is your background? So we picked out a couple of options. So for me, my background originally was agriculture. I had a chance to grow vegetables for a long time before I got into food safety and produce safety. But we love to know, hey, what's your background? Is it agriculture? You grew up on a farm. You have a horticulture degree. You manage crews. Maybe B, food science, microbiologist, sanitation. You studied food safety programs. Or just your first job out of college, you found out that you're the new food safety manager at a farmer facility. C, adult education. You were trained to teach. You were taught how to train. But really, adult education is your background. And then one of my favorites is other. I think we'd love to know, do you have anyone whose background was experimental poetry? Or maybe you were a baker first, or you were an underwater welder. Just whatever your background was before you got into produce safety and food safety. And this is definitely a thing that we will come back to. Oh, of course, man, agricultural business. Very cool. Environmental microbiology. This is something that we'll come back to. And if you want to expand on your other, we would love to know what that other is. Very cool. Thank you. Excited to engage more with these in the Q&A and for our other presenters, just to get a better idea about what our audience is. And for me, I had an opportunity to learn more about adult education, go to UGA, receive a master's in adult ed. And so there's two things I want to share before I leave. One is my favorite adult education theory today. And then the second is my favorite non-traditional adult education book. So something that I think about a lot, and I think that we can bring to our training and our teaching programs is this theory of constructivism. And the first, or one of the first parts is really just understanding the backgrounds and experiences of our students and the other people that we're learning with. So that's one of the reasons just to know where you're from, why you're here, but really understanding what knowledge are these adults already bringing to the room outside of the food safety information that we're gonna be sharing. And then we all work in an industry where teaching through active engagement, experiential, hands-on education can be incredibly effective. Squeezing that compost, scrubbing a bin, even just doing some record keeping, mixing chemicals together, but knowing their background, actively engaging with them, and then problem solving. And I think we're all trying to solve one big problem, which is reducing risk. But by doing that, we can also figure out what other problems are happening on the farm. So sometimes, or in the facility, we're reducing this risk, but maybe we're extending shelf life. We're figuring out how to reduce risk through a really good training program. At the same time, we're increasing employee engagement, we're increasing happiness. And then here today, I think with our backgrounds and experience, the problem we're all trying to solve is how do we do this effectively? How do we get that behavior change that we want to see happen through our education, our training, and our teaching? So if you have no adult education in your background, or even if you do, I'd really encourage you to check out my favorite theory of constructivism. And then Alexis, my last slide. 
So I thought about maybe like highlighting one of the books that I had in school, but really right now the book that has me fired up about adult education is the Upright Citizens Brigade Comedy Improvisation Manual. And if you've ever had a chance to go to an improv show, what you're watching is a bunch of people on stage responding to ideas from the audience and then actively listening to each other. And I think for a lot of us, when we're teaching training, we either be it in a facility, a classroom, out in the field, in a lot of ways, we're on stage and you're just responding to whatever is coming at you. And you don't always really know what's going to come from the audience. And what this book really teaches you is a couple important principles. One is just yes and not shutting down what you're hearing, but either complimenting it or going, okay, you said this. If then, I think it can also be a, it's complicated and it depends, but not shutting down our audience, but really saying yes and building off of their past experiences. And also in improv comedy means identifying the unusual thing. So when we're teaching food safety, we can go in a million different ways. Even just someone gives a class about water testing. You're talking about the priority safety rule. You're talking about gap audits. You're talking about indicator organisms. Same way on an improv stage, things can go in a million different ways. But as an improviser and as a teacher, you want to identify what's that core principle? What's that unusual thing that's going to move this forward and have a really good conversation going? And to do that, we have to be active listeners with our audience, with our farmers, with the other trainers in the room. We have to just commit to it. You have to bring a level of energy and excitement to really see that behavior change. And maybe the most important thing is make your partner look good. And that means when the students are engaging with you, when your colleagues are engaging with you, really uplifting their ideas and finding a way to solve those problems together, recognizing all of our different backgrounds, experiences, and cultures, and working together to really improve things for the greater good. Constructivism, this manual from the Upright Citizens Brigade, and really today thinking about the how. How are we going to teach what we know to see that behavior change? So with that, I'm very excited. There are a lot of responses in the chat. I just saw them like flying through. Very excited to pass the mic over to Jackie and then see y'all during the Q&A. Thank you so much, Billy. And thank you again for the, the invitation to this great conversation. Uh, and let's please go next because I packed a lot of information for 15 minutes. Got very excited about this topic. So I, we are talking today about different training principles, especially as we think about education for adults. And today I will focus on the last three that you can see on my slide, which are cultural awareness and diversity, collaborative efforts and leadership and communication training. And I really love how Billy talked so much about trying a change in behavior because these three last points are really, have really been game changers for us in our industry to achieve that. Next. First of all, I would like to start with cultural awareness. And to do that, I'm really, I would really like to know from you, what is culture to you? Next slide, please, Alexis. When you hear the word culture, what comes to your head? What does culture mean to you? Please uh, type in your answers in, your, in the chat so we can see some of those answers. Tradition. Thank you, Jonathan. Community, a way of being. Family history. Mindset, family, what is accepted for by family, identity, shared traditions, values. Wonderful responses. Thank you so much, everyone. Please keep sharing your responses and we can have a, a, a conversation about culture later on. Thoughtfulness and awareness. Great. Thank you so much. I would like to focus on the component of language within culture for a minute. Next. Next slide, please, Alexis. And I want to uh, focus on language because culture goes beyond our language. And in the last decade or so, we have seen this switch or this great effort into translating all the wonderful material, training material that we have in agriculture and produce safety and worker safety into different languages because we want to increase inclusivity. But culture goes way beyond our language. And here is a quick example. You know, on the left, you can see 17 different ways of, or Spanish words for popcorn. And on the right, you can see some different ways that popcorn is used around the world. This is all influenced by culture. 
these 17 different ways of saying popcorn is not, they are not 17 different dialects. They are just the way people in their own country say this word. And this is, again, influenced my culture. And you may be thinking, that's okay. I will never say popcorn in one of my classes. Let's go to the next slide. Here are 12 different ways to say pan in Spanish. And I'm pretty sure you will say pen at some point in one of your classes. In fact, I did that for the first three years in my position in my classes. I used to say pen in the translation from Ecuador. And a class full of Mexican people would not understand what I was saying. Now we are dealing with cross-cultural communication, not just translation, because language is culture and culture is language. Next, please. The fact is that culture is more than just traditions or the holidays that we have or the food we eat, the language we speak. Culture, like someone said in our chat, or in our chat is the framework, framework around which we build our identities. It is the way we engage with the world. It's our perspectives, the expectations we have of people or of the world. And all of us have multiple identities built on multiple cultures. For example, I'm Ecuadorian, so I have an Ecuadorian culture, but I also have a North American culture because I've been living here for 10 years. And I also have a migrant culture because I came here from a different country. So when we acknowledge that there are different cultures and experiences, we truly start fostering an atmosphere of inclusivity. Because we realize there are different habits, there are different traditions, there are different norms, depending on our cultures. That way we make, when we acknowledge that, we help our students feel safe and more comfortable. And we truly go to that concept of cultural awareness, which is understanding your own culture, other people's culture, and the role of culture in education. Next, please. Here are some ways on how you can foster cultural awareness in your program. This is not something that happened overnight for us. Uh, this is a still a work in progress. And if you are uh, working on cultural awareness in your program, please share what are you doing because I'd be very curious to know. But some tips that have worked for us. Start with self-awareness. Think about your own cultural background, your ethnicity, your race, your religion, your uh, socioeconomical aspects also influence culture. And then think about the culture of others, your students, your coworkers. When you start with self-awareness, you are able to identify the cultural gaps and ways to bridge that gap. When you have self-awareness, then try to communicate with cultural awareness. A person's cultural background will define the way they communicate. For example, some cultures avoid eye contact. Some other cultures have very distinctive attitudes toward authority. I have noticed, so we have to note those invisible and subtle differences between cultures. I have noticed here in the U.S., people tend to be very direct with feedback or criticism. I can tell you in Latin America, people can take that direct criticism as something very personal or even something offensive. Note those differences between cultures. Also think about the examples you use in your class. As trainers, we sometimes try to use examples that are relevant to us. Those might not be very relevant for other people because of their cultures. So think about those examples. And also think about the food you offer in your training. Food is very important to make people happy. It makes me happy. People will remember a training where they had food that brought them closer to home. Next slide, please. Also seek to understand before being understood. As trainers and program developers, we are always thinking about ways to make our training materials understandable and how can we explain certain things so that people can understand us. Let's take a few minutes and try to understand our students, our audience. And to do that, you can start your classes with team building exercises or integrate icebreakers throughout your classes. These are very simple, short activities that will bring your participants closer together. Everyone can share a laugh and you can learn about culture. 
If you have any questions about these exercises, feel free to ask during Q&A or send me an email and I can share some ideas for these activities. If you don't have enough time throughout your class, you can use lunch for these learning activities and cultural experiences. And finally, consider taking a cultural awareness class because we all see the world through our own cultural lens. And until we take proper cultural training, we can only judge the world and others through our cultural lens. And we may not be able to see one situation through different perspectives simultaneously. Next, please. Now I will move on to the next principle that has worked really well for us, which is collaboration. Next, please. Collaboration has been key to a success in our training program here in Washington. And we have been able to build a very positive interdependent relationship between academia, industry, state and agencies and extension. The way we build this interdependent relationship is by realizing that each of us has a specific skills, knowledge and resources, but we all have one shared interest, one common goal. We are all somehow involved in the education of the industry. So when sharing those skills and those resources to make up a, what, one great program for the industry. Next. So how does collaboration look like in Washington? We have a mantra, which is food safety is not a competitive advantage, but this mantra also goes for education. Education is not a competitive advantage because if we give information to our growers, we give them power. That power makes the whole industry look well. So education is not uh, something that we can compete with. This way of thinking, again, same as culture and awareness, didn't happen overnight in our industry. It took some time and years, especially for people that are resistant about sharing information. But with some practice, and it took a couple people to start sharing information to have this snowball effect where everyone has an open door policy now in our industry. With that open door policy, we've been able to do hands-on workshops in farms and packing houses. On the right, you can see a cleaning and sanitation workshop where we did that in several packing houses in Washington. Our trainers were food safety managers. Their cleaning and sanitation crews were the ones demonstrating how to clean the equipment. Chemical suppliers donated the chemicals to clean the equipment. And academia was involved to do classroom presentations. This was a very uh, synergetic relationship to create one great workshop for the industry. And we have done environmental workshops, water testing workshops, following that same model. We have also produced several industry videos, customized to the industry, again, in packing houses, in farms. You can go to YouTube and type in Washington State Tree Fruit Association and you will find our videos. And we rely a lot on train the trainer courses. We do that to build trainer capacity in Washington. So when we want to do PSA grower training courses, we use those trainers that got certified in trainer courses and they bring not only the knowledge from that course, but also the experience for, from working in the industry. Next, please. We also have formed food safety coffee groups, which are very fun groups made up of many different food safety managers from farms and packing houses. They get together once a month. They share emails about their concerns, their challenges, solutions they have found uh, to those challenges. Again, with that open door policy, we have field days with academia, our annual meetings with more than 2000 attendees learning about research and industry trends. And we also like to work a lot with our out-of-state organizations. We have worked with ISBAs many times to put together recall-ready workshops, Listeria workshops for the industry. And it's great to have that collaboration because you learn from each other. Next. Finally, I will talk about leadership and communication training that we've been doing here in Washington. Uh, next, please. For so long, we have focused on teaching our growers what are the latest regulations, how to implement those regulations, how to teach training, what are the training requirements that, we, that they have to do to comply with regulations. But have we taught them how to communicate that content that they are learning in our classes? Think about our audience during our training programs. Those are growers that manage hundreds of people. 
farm supervisors, facility supervisors that manage hundreds of people. How are we teaching them to communicate the content that we are teaching in our produce safety, worker safety, food safety classes? There are many different communication and leadership styles. And these classes that we are, not de that we are developing are not directing for upper management or the owners of farms or packing houses. They are directed to the farm supervisors, to the facility supervisors. They are the ones in the line. And because we think that leadership is not tied to an authority or, or to a position, leadership is a skill that can de be developed in anyone, and it should be developed in our workforce. They should be developing emotional intelligence and a coaching mentality to deal with people that resist implementing regulation. With that coaching mentality, people start seeing regulations as opportunities and not obligations. And this goes back to Billy's point. We start seeing that change in behavior. Next, this is how the agricultural leadership program was born. And this is the perfect example of a synergetic relationship between academia, extension, state agencies, and nonprofit organizations and the industry. Next. And with this program, we are teaching our farm supervisors and managers uh, about goal setting, team meetings, emotional intelligence, time management, effective delegation, communication, stress management. Why are we not focusing on stress management? Agriculture is stressful. Agri uh, agricultural suicide is higher than in the military. So we should be teaching how to manage stress. And I can tell you, once you build that base, on how to communicate, how to delegate, how to manage time and people, the rest comes very easily. Compliance, regulatory compliance, efficiency, productivity, fr fruit quality, because this is the base that you need in your, for your workforce. So I would encourage anyone to look into programs like this that have been game changers for us. And with that, I will take questions during the Q&A session, but I will uh, ask Betsy to please take over this conversation. Thank you. I really appreciate the opportunity to contribute to the conversation, Jackie. Building off of the information you and Billy have provided, I want to discuss the importance of testing educational materials as a way to continue to nurture a positive food safety culture. Next slide, please. Over the last 25 years of working with farmers, and, and this was really punctuated by the COVID-19 pandemic, I find that growers that develop and nurture a positive food safety culture are better able to navigate the day-to-day -day challenges that happen on a farm, including weather, markets, climate change, and even the pandemic. An important part of food safety culture is training and communication. I want to talk about these guiding principles to developing effective educational materials. First, you have to understand the research and on-farm practices to create relevant educational materials. It's critically important to know your audience and what your audience needs. Also, you need to define the goal of your messaging. What is it that you're hoping growers will do differently? Again, looking at that behavior change that Billy mentioned, being clear and concise. Um, time is of the essence. Jackie just mentioned the stress that's involved with farming. We want to keep information available and to the point. And then, of course, testing your messaging. Next slide, please. I'm going to talk about each of these over the next few slides. When we talk about nurturing a positive food safety culture, it really is, it really does go beyond food safety. And it comes up in things like labor retention, employee collaboration, business enhancement. Billy even mentioned happiness. I think all of us have to think, are we happy day to day? And if we're not, we look to get out of that situation, right? So that positive food safety culture supports the farm in many more ways than food safety. But from a food safety perspective, it means that every day people have their eye on food safety. They are paying attention to food safety, even if their job has nothing to do with food safety. And then when I wrote that sentence, I thought to myself, can I name a job on the farm that doesn't impact food safety? And I can come up with food safety impacting every job. I just want to say, even if the main focus of your job isn't food safety, your actions every day on the farm influence food safety, right? So preventing contamination has always been the goal. We know removing contamination isn't really effective in a fresh product. And those farms with that positive food safety culture are much more nimble. And we really saw this in COVID-19 when we had new guidelines, when people had to reshuffle their businesses. 
the folks that had that culture made that change more quickly. And that's why it's important beyond food safety. Next slide, please. So when we talk about research, this is one that's a fairly big topic of conversation recently. And the issue is we have lots of research going on out there. And just because research proves it's possible, it might not be relevant. And that doesn't mean basic research isn't important. It's of course important, but we have to look at research that actually represents situations that we're likely to see on farms, right? So you gotta dig through all these citations and find out what's the research that really matters here. It's that same concept of hazard and risk. There's lots of hazards on the farm. They're not all risks, right? So narrowing it down to the information that's important. Recognize that some extrapolations are gonna have to happen because we're never gonna have research on every region and every commodity, but really focus on the stuff that's relevant to the growers you're working with. Understand what farm practices are relevant. Education materials have that goal of behavior change. Again, Billy mentioned that behavior change at the very beginning. Growers are looking for solutions not just information, right? They want it to be actionable. And change has to be achievable. Otherwise, you, you can't give them something they can't achieve. That's not really productive. Next slide. How do we get to know our audiences? And I, I love following Jackie for my presentation for this because the culture of your audience is so important to what you're doing. But these questions are, who is the audience? If I say a farm personnel, that's a very different group of people right? Is it a field worker? Is it a manager? Is it a crew chief? Is it a packing house person? So you have to think about that. Maybe it's extension educators. PSA, we spend a lot of time focusing on PSA trainers and extension educators. We look for that multiplier effect, or as Jackie was saying, that synergy we can get. And of course, regulatory personnel. What change needs to be achieved? Changing knowledge is different than changing a practice, right? And so you have to know what you're aiming for. Does the audience think the change is necessary? Writing a how-to with steps is fine if you know they're going to do it. But if you have to motivate them to do it, you have to build that into the material as well. What does your audience need? Information, tools, templates, decision trees. Again, that gets back to the question of what are you trying to do? What change do you want to see? And how do they need it delivered? Paper, electronic, is there different languages? Love the slides of pen and popcorn and all these different languages, right? What are you trying to convey into who? The level of literacy, right? We have a lot of immigrant farmers, maybe in this country, may not speak a language that any of us speak, right? So we have to consider all of these things. And how are you going to get it to them? Community access, what is culturally appropriate? We have lots of groups in this country in agriculture who have been mistreated by the government or by other groups. You have to have a trusted communicator in that group if you want access to that group. And it's important to think about who is that trusted communicator and how do I make a relationship with them? Next slide. So in defining the goal of messaging, this might sound simple. Oh, I just wanna teach them this. That's really simple. Except it's not as simple because there's no baseline of what that group knows. If you're making a material for a widespread group of people, where is their knowledge? Where do you start talking to them? Or where do you start approaching them about a topic? And think about it this way. If it starts too simple, people will be like, it's boring. I already know that. You don't need to tell me anything. I've got it all taken care of. But if you go too complex, then you're going to lose them. And they're not going to start with you because you haven't gotten there. So really finding that sweet spot. Most people don't read details. We have a running joke in the Produce Safety Alliance group. Nobody reads, right? You make these fact sheets, nobody reads the fact sheets. You send an email, nobody reads that, right? Um, but the research details are very important. How do you convey this complex information simply at a level people will understand when it's really complex with very few words? So it's a challenge. And you have to return to the goal all the time and ask yourself, what am I really doing here? What am I hoping to convey? What practice am I hoping to change? It's easy to get off the path when it's complex. And in fairness, I don't think people are always thinking this much about it. I think Billy was talking about, okay, you get a degree in, in adult education. Lots of people haven't thought about adult education before. So they don't always think about the purposefulness or the intentionalness of developing educational materials. And we really have to get there if we want those changes to occur. Sometimes the goals change and you have to know when that happens so that you change your approach as well. Next slide. Being clear and concise, one of the hardest things 
anyone can do because you want to cut to the chase. You want to use words that are meaningful. Unlike scientific writing, extension writing really requires us to answer the so what. I mentioned earlier, growers want solutions. If they don't read the document and go, oh, this is what I need to do, you've lost a lot of their attention and that effort. Don't be afraid to use words. I hear a lot of people tell me you can't use those big scientific terms. I completely disagree. I think that is people saying you're not smart enough to understand this word. I like to turn it around and say, as a trainer, as an educator, I need to be creative enough. I need to be patient enough. I need to be diligent enough to create materials that allow you to learn these hard words, that allow you to become good at using these words in, in, in conversation and in your daily use so that you can interact with the people you need to interact with, whether that be buyers or regulatory personnel, right? So it's unacceptable to me that we say, I can't use terms with people because they're too hard. And review and edit for content accuracy, most important. And relevance. I have to tell you, words matter, as Jackie pointed out. All those different words for pen and popcorn. I'll say that again. But grammar matters. My favorite statement, the let's eat grandma. If that comma is misplaced, it, it's a lot different, right? That grammar matters, that punctuation matters, and context matters. Give it to them in a situation they understand. Make it relevant to the farm practices. Next slide, please. Testing your message. This is where I want to spend the remainder of my time because I think this is really important. The biggest challenge to testing the message is that it takes time. There are assumptions as educators. You think to yourself, I wrote it. I know this information. Of course, this is the best way to convey this information. I know, dummy. I wouldn't make a mistake, right? We all go into this. We all have that professional background. There are also legal requirements, right? You got to go through the Institutional Review Board. That takes more time, can be frustrating. You have to find audience. You have to find a group of growers who are willing to give you time so that you can test your educational materials. A group of growers that are also willing to give you feedback you may or may not want to hear. An investment. We need to pay people for their time. I firmly believe this. We need to get to the point where we're not treating growers' time as free for us, right? So we have to come up with compensation for them. And that feedback can be painful. Nobody sets out to do a poor job or insult people. It can be hard to hear when people don't like something you've spent a lot of time on. I've worked with people who refuse to hear it. They will make excuses for why the person who reviewed it doesn't know what they're talking about. And sometimes people will ask you for changes that you can't incorporate. And I'm gonna give you a few examples of where we could tread and where we couldn't on some of these educational materials. The reward is that if done well, the materials have a significant positive impact on the people that you're trying to convey information to. Next slide. So here's a few examples. I wanna get into the real, the real meat of this. Even the most expense, experienced educators have biases, myself included. Focus groups put that information in front of the intended audiences and allow them to give you feedback so that that material can be more effective for them. It must be done in an open and non-defensive and objective fashion. You cannot get your emotions involved here. This is about the audience and making changes. And it's most effective when focus groups are diverse. And I put an asterisk here because I think sometimes with diversity, we're thinking skin color right? Or we're thinking different cultures, but this can be ages. This can be occupations. This can be a lot of different things that add into that diversity. I absolutely think cultural diversity is good. Age diversity, racial diversity, all of that is very important, but I want to stress it's all of it. They're all very important. And this has to do with who is your audience. That's the group you really want to focus on, especially if you have materials that are targeted to a specific group. The two pictures you see here, one on the left and one on the right, the one on the left is the original illustration before it went through a focus group. And one of the things we got from the focus groups was how do we add some of this diversity here? And you can see the difference that happened on the right. You can also see, aside from the adding of diversity that happened, we got rid of people because it was too crowded and they felt like it wasn't able to capture what the goal of this illustration was. And 
just as uh, in our chat box, what do you all think the goal of this illustration was? Can anybody tell me what they think the goal of this illustration was? Oh, the chat box is quiet. Nobody wants to tell me. Visitor training, right. What do visitors need to know? What do you need to tell visitors as far as, right there, as far as the produce safety rule is concerned, right? You have to tell them what the policies are and you have to provide hand washing and toilet facilities. Thank you for that. I'm gonna move on to the next one, please. Here's another one. This one was here at Cornell University when I arrived 25 years ago. I was handed this poster and said, go focus group this to finish it up. Anybody want to guess when I focus group this with a bunch of farm worker, farm workers, what, when I asked them, what do you think this poster is trying to tell you? Anybody want to guess what they thought the take home of this poster was? This is one of my favorite focus groups ever. You can get sick. Great. You can get sick, right? That's a good one. You're getting close. Don't poop in the field. Don't poop in my field. Exercise. Great. I love the exercise. Okay. So here's the take home of what happened with this. In this focus group, the take home from the group was if you poop in the field, you can make a white guy sick. And if you wash your hands, you get to play soccer. That was what the, the take home ended up being. And you can tell from this, the messages were confused. This was not at all what we were trying to convey. So I stopped and then after the focus, after they, they gave me all this feedback for quite a time, I said, here's what we were trying to convey. And what the group came up with was, oh, next slide, please. You are really trying to convey two different things. One, you want us to wash our hands. So that's a different concept. And one, you want us to use the portable toilets. And I will say at the time I did this 20 years ago, the farm workers also told me, yeah, we'll use a toilet when they put them in the field, right? This is back when toilets weren't as prevalent in the field. So they told me to break it into two, two concepts. Each poster should be one concept. Don't mix concepts because that whole thing of exercise getting in there confused everybody, right? And then next slide. Then we came up with another problem, which was, uh, next slide, Alexis, sorry, the toilet paper issue. In countries that have bad plumbing, you don't put toilet paper in the toilet, but you come to the U.S. and you expect it to be in the toilet. And then we added a third poster talking about this is what you do with toilet paper. Okay, so all of that from a focus group in the set. And I think this is much better, right? It conveys the message much more clearly. Next slide. Here's one we did for photonovela that we did for a focus group with about why were we talking about what happens in a kitchen? Because a lot of farm labor share kitchens, cleanliness. We focus group this, it focus group terrible with men. And I got a call from one of the people doing a focus group and I was told, this is focus grouping terrible with men. What are we going to do? And we decided to move forward with it because we thought in this culture, women tend to do a lot of the cooking. And even if it, it did well with women, we were going to move forward. In addition, we ended up adding a page about how to mix sanitizers for the kitchen because that was a question that came out. So we could, in fact, add material to this, even though it didn't focus group so well with men. Next slide. All of this to say it's worth the effort. Support a positive food safety culture. Providing relevant education materials tailored to audience needs is effective for sharing information and making those behavior changes. Testing the materials is critical. We all make mistakes. We all have biases. People are worth the effort. People appreciate the effort, I will tell you that. And a positive food safety culture must be nurtured if it's going to survive. And um, that takes me out. Here's some information, and I'm going to hand it off to Kristen. Great. Thank you, Betsy. Um, and thank you, Laura, for that really great introduction at the beginning of our session. Like she said, my name is Kristen Woods, and I'm a Sustainable Food Systems Resource Specialist with Tuskegee University, part of a small team of talented field educators with the Tuskegee University Extension Program. Almost our entire team is pictured on uh, my introduction slide there. Uh, so today I'm going to talk a little bit about the practical application of adult education theory as it relates to the history of our extension program, our current activities, and our future direct directions. Next slide. First, a little Alabama land-grant history. Alabama is actually the only state in the U.S. with three land-grant universities. We have Auburn University, Alabama A&M University, and Tuskegee University. The Tuskegee University Cooperative Extension Program stands out among all the others because from its founding, in Booker T. Washington envisioned Tuskegee Institute as having an outreach mission. 
He made regular trips on horseback to connect with rural people and encourage them to come to his school. But he also realized the farmers were not going to travel to Tuskegee. He was going to have to bring the Tuskegee Institute to them. In 1896, George Washington Carver arrived at Tuskegee to head the School of Agriculture. He carried Washington's practice of rural visits further by loading a buggy with tools and materials and traveling to farms on weekends to give practical demonstrations. In 1897, Carver gained support for, from the legislator to build the first movable school, which included a four-wheeled coach loaded with tools, seed packets, and some demonstration plants. Next slide. In November 1906, the Ag Agent was officially initiated, first in Alabama with the appointment of Mr. Campbell as an extension agent, and later in that same month in Texas with the appointment of Mr. Stallings as a county extension agent. Now, by this time in 1906, Tuskegee University had been providing extension support for decades via farm demonstrations, field visits, and the movable school. Additionally, the annual Farmers Conference was in its 15th year in 1906, and we are about to host the 132nd Farmers Conference this March, which will make it the longest-running event of this type in the nation. This model of experiential learning and outreach became the extension model for land gra the land grant system today. Next slide. So today's extension programming is rooted in this history and the principles of andragogy, which did not become a popularized field of study until the 1970s. So I've narrowed down that field of study into about four concepts, um, the needs assessment, objectives, engaging content, and application and practice. So Billy talked about taking a constructivism approach and the needs assessment is really imperative to doing this. Uh, we need to find out where farmers are knowledge-wise and geographically, right? And we need to find out even more importantly where they want to go. And we need to be flexible in the moment to make sure we're addressing needs as they come up. And I love Billy's suggestion about employing improv skills to keep things moving in the right direction. So your learning objectives help you reach the right people with the right programming and help learners stay motivated when they understand what they will achieve by the end of an activity. And using a variety of instructional methods will keep adults engaged. This might include lectures, discussions, group activities, case studies, hands-on exercises, and multimedia resources. Incorporating real-world examples that relate to uh, the farmer's experiences into the methods also helps in keep farmers engaged. Active participation and interaction among adult learners is the final component that is necessary to achieve those higher levels of learning. For example, being able to make a decision about what to do with product when a food safety hazard is identified versus simply knowing that a risk is present. Adults often learn best when they can share their experiences and insights using group discussions, problem-solving activities, and opportunities for peer-to-peer -peer learning have their roots in a collectivism approach where everyone learns more when everyone is sharing information. Next slide. So today's Tuskegee University Cooperative Extension Program applies these principles by working to support quality of life and economic prosperity across the Black Belt of Alabama. Our small team has a primary focus on a 12-county region across the center of Alabama. Next slide. The program that I want to highlight first as an example today is essentially a modern-day movable school. We call this the Farm Innovation Project, and it consists of a movable a trailer on wheels that, is, that houses a number of, of experiential learning exercises. And this method really remains the best way to reach farmers, in, in my experience. The Farm Innovation Project was implemented across the regional Black Belt in collaboration with Billy Mitchell when he was with the National Farmers Union, uh, Camila Rodriguez at Auburn University, Andrew Williams with the Deep South Food Alliance, Joshua Dawson at Fort Malley State University, Alicia Shavers at Alabama A&M University, and we also had a ton of support from Dr. Elizabeth Miles at Alcorn State University and Carolyn and Chris Jones with the Mississippi Minority Farmers of I Alliance. The educational components themselves were determined by a producer advisory board. The methods were also guided by this board, and the representatives from the farmer community actually facilitated many of the activities. We created fact sheets for producers to take home, but also facilitator guides to make it easy for a novice to facilitate an activity 
that's rooted in that constructivism and that collectivism approach. Next slide. Um, we just completed the NIFA Food Safety Outreach Program funded portion of the Farm Innovation Project, so I can share some of those results with you. Across the board, participants reported a gain in confidence post participating in an activity. And they also reported that they're more likely to install an on-farm hand washing sink, install a cool bot storage unit, make a farm map, or test their water. Our focus groups revealed that funding or other resources are still a barrier to implementation for many farmers, and we're currently working to address this. Um, the data is not yet published, but there's a stakeholder report available on the National Food Safety Clearinghouse, and you can snap that uh, QR code if you want to take a look at that. Next slide. Our team of educators still conducts a ton of one-on-one -on -one consultations, field visits, and farm demonstrations today. Over the last couple of years, I think one of the most common requests is installing drip irrigation. It's a really a wonderful feeling to spend a few hours at a farm or, or community garden and have the irrigation system working when you leave that day. These on-farm demonstrations evolve into peer-to-peer -peer learning because the farmers in attendance will reach out to the host farmer for more information or for help with implementation on their farm. And when you have a small team of educators, building this network of farmer peer-to-peer -peer support is imperative. I next slide, I have a few more examples of some of our, our workshops and field work. On this slide, I'm showing on the left, a group of youth learning how to use a commercial watcher, a washer from a local farmer, John Brown. On the right, we have Dr. Gregory Bernard giving a drone and rover demonstration. And he's talking about how these new tools can be used to help with scouting for diseases and pests through imaging technology. And he's on our organic farm in this picture, but we also have a program to meet, bring this technology to the outlying areas in the Black Belt. On the left, I'm showing an, oh, next slide. <laughs> on the left, I'm showing an event from our herd health program led by Dr. Quentin Gray. I think this is probably my favorite example of leveraging the higher education assets to further aid the extension mission. In this case, faculty, veterinary students, extension ed educators, and ranchers work together to assess the health of a herd. They provide vaccinations, warming, and other services as needed. They'll go out more than once to an individual ranch, but the idea is that over time, the rancher is able to implement the care by themselves. The program has made a tremendous impact to empower limited resource ranchers in the Black Belt to improve profitability. I also think it's important from a systems approach because healthy cattle reduces the chances of zoonotic spread of disease to humans. So lastly, in, in, using engaging methods does not always mean you need to be on the farm or have expensive equipment. I think this photo is from a, oh, go back one, sorry. <laughs> This photo on the right there is from a PSA advanced training where we took some previously lecture-based content and created a guided discussion activity. Essentially, we asked participants to discuss and then they taught each other the material. The facilitator simply fills in the gaps and helps participants stay on track. Yeah, next slide. So finally, I wanted to talk briefly about the Carver Integrated S Sustainability Center, or as we call it, the CISC which was formed to take the roots of extension work into the future to tackle some of the world's most challenging problems. The CISC engages interdisciplinary faculty, uses cutting edge science and experiential learning to empower marginalized stakeholders. Drawing on a resilient experiential education model, the CISC houses programs like, the next slide, the Black Belt Marketing and Innovation Center, which is a fruit and vegetable aggregation and processing center, uh, which provides space for transformational research, teaching, hands-on training, and meeting the infrastructure needs of the surrounding community of growers. I'm excited to be a part of the team that is developing programming for the BBMIC and to be working with our research faculty, students, farmers, and extension ed educators in doing so. This is one of many CISC programs, so I want to invite you to visit the website for more information. You can find it via the QR code or hit at c.org. Next slide. Lastly, we probably left you with a lot of ideas on how to make produce safety training more interesting, engaging, and impactful. There exists a guide from the National Farmers Union that can help with the practical implementation of training programs. 
The guide covers some adult ed theory, cultural competencies, audio and visual enhancements, and examples of activities. So check it out on the National Food Safety Clearinghouse. Next slide. So I want to thank you, uh, Laura and Alexis, for arranging this webinar and you all for listening. My contact information is on the screen, so feel free to email, text, or call for more information about any of our extension programs. I learned a ton, um, and it was a really engaging conversation. I do like the waterfall chat. Also want to remind everyone that we are coming back in less than a month, December 7th, another Thursday, 3.30 p.m. Eastern. We'll be tackling sanitation at retail. I'm very excited about this webinar. Uh, I'm excited about all the webinars, but I'm really excited about this one too. We'll send out the registration for that, as well as you all get a copy of the recording for today, as well as the contact information for each of our wonderful speakers. Thank you all again and see you in less than a month. And thank you to all the speakers. Really appreciate it.